This is another session of the Back to School webinar. So this session is a repeat session. We had this session yesterday for the first time. And if you are just joining us, then you are welcome. Um, this session is worth having again because I believe that what we shared in yesterday's um, Back to School session was really very pertinent. So I hope that you are ready to go on this journey with me. We are going to be looking at understanding your child's learning styles, your, your, your child's learning style, sorry. And I will be your lead coach on this journey. I am Dr. Jenny Bossi, I'm a parenting coach and I am the founder of Parenting with Dr. Jen. So if you're just joining me, you are welcome. And this session, we are going to be looking at understanding your child's learning style. We are also going to look at um, how to help your child develop you know, great study habits that can help them thrive academically. Then the, the theme of this back to school webinar, this back to school 2023 webinar is helping your child thrive academically. So we have looked at a series of themes from the start of this um, webinar series, which is geared towards helping parents understand firstly that their participation, their involvement in their children's um, academic journey is most important and that the school on its own is not responsible for your child's academic success. So you have your role to play. And I love this quote by Jane D. Hall, which says that at the end of the day, the most overwhelming key to the overall success of children is the positive involvement of parents. So I'm sure you are here because you are a parent that values or that understands that your participation cannot be overlooked, that your role can actually help your child become and do so much better on their academic journey. So if you're here and you are a parent to a child who is struggling academically, who maybe from the beginning or from the start of their journey has not had it very easy, then I am super glad that you are here because one of the things that I have shared continuously from the start of this webinar series till now is the fact that, you know, the struggling child today can become an excelling child tomorrow, right? It just depends on getting the right knowledge that you need to help you help your child thrive and excel. I believe that when parents are knowledgeable, they are very well positioned to be able to become an advantage to their children on not just their parenting journey, but in this case, their child's academic journey. There is no dull child, right? We've emphasized this over and over since the start of this particular back to school webinar series. There's no such thing as a dull child, right? Intelligence is not fixed. Intelligence is not just natural. Even if you do not come from a line of parents or of, of predecessors, that can be tagged as intelligent or smart, you can do great things even from where you are. Intelligence can be built, intelligence can be boosted, intelligence can be developed. That's why we are here to learn about how we can help our children excel and do so much better on their academic journey. So helping your child thrive academically, right? That has been our focus since the start of this webinar series. Today we're going to look at learning styles. When if you if you have not if you are yet to watch um, the past sessions that we have had, I encourage you. You're going to find um, the videos on this particular playlist of all the past sessions we've had because we've shared what we have shared so far leads up to this particular session today. So taking just this one is great, but I encourage you to link it up with what we have done in the past sessions. We have looked at how nutrition, you know, is necessary or impacts your child's academic journey. We have also looked at how to nurture the love for learning. We have looked at how to create a right learning environment that can help your child thrive. We have also looked at, you know, the school choice and reasons why some children struggle academically. That's one of my favorite reasons why some children struggle academically. Because if as a parent, right, you should have um, a situation where your child maybe begins to struggle. Maybe your child has always done well, 
But there are sometimes, particularly during transition periods, maybe a child is moving from one grade level to another, or your child has to move from one school to another, or just maybe your child transitions from the primary to the secondary level. I have had quite a good number of parents reach out to me during these transition points to tell me of how their children that used to do so well began to decline. And until you understand the reasons why a child may struggle academically, you may find it difficult, you know, helping your child in such a situation. That is why it is worth you know, having knowledge as to how to begin to troubleshoot that process. How do you troubleshoot a situation where a child that used to do so well suddenly begins to decline? So knowledge is key, right? Purposeful parenting thrives on knowledge. The knowledgeable parent is better positioned, you know, to tackle the challenges that they may face because challenges will come. You're going to face situations where, you know, you, f you feel like you're backed up against the wall. It's the knowledge that you have during those seasons that will enable you to make decisions that will help you and your child to continue to journey in the positive direction. So and when, once you know the different reasons why a child may struggle or begin to decline in their academics, then you are going to know exactly where to tackle the situation from. Because the thing is, for most um, 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 cases, when a child begins to struggle, when a child begins to decline, the very first thing that we rush to do is just to find a lesson teacher. We think of maybe causing them to read more. We start blaming the fact that the children are playing too much. Or we start thinking like, oh, I think you need more. You need extra lessons. You need to study more. And we have our kids go, 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 read, read, read. No time to rest, no time to play. Because we believe that every academic struggle is related to the fact that the child is probably not doing they are very, very best, which is not the case. There are different reasons why a child may struggle in their, on their academic journey. And one of those reasons is what we call a learning incompatibility. That's what we tackled. We looked at the reasons why some children struggle in their academics. You know, the learning incompatibility has to do with a child's learning style. Maybe your child has a learning style that is not being catered to um, by their teacher. Maybe your child, for example, is an English-speaking student and their teacher speaks Chinese. That's, that's my favorite um, analogy to use, that your child may be an English speaker and they are supposed to learn from a teacher who speaks Chinese. That's going to be quite a challenge because if you can't hear what the teacher is saying, then surely you're going to struggle with whatever it is that your teacher is teaching you. So understanding your child's learning style is one of the things that every parent must strive to do because not only does it help your child on their academic journey, but even in your parenting, right? Because how your child learns will also help you, the parents, train them more effectively, teach them more effectively because parenting is teaching. Parents are teachers. So you are kidding yourself if you think that, hey, I don't need to learn how to teach, then you're going to struggle because as a parent, you are the first teacher in the life of your child. You need to know how your child learns and you will see that it makes a big difference even in the results that you have on your parenting journey. Because when you know that your child learns best this way, you realize that even the way you instruct them, even the way you teach them the different things you have to teach them is going to change. And that is what makes the difference. So we're going to look at the different learning styles and we're going to look through each and every one of them. And then from those learning styles, we're gonna discuss how you can help your child develop study habits that relate to how they learn to help them get the most out of their learning, out of their academics. And as we go through this journey, you're going to see that sometimes some of the things that we fault our children for really was pointless. Some children that may end up being tagged lazy or end up being tagged as um, dull even, it's just because they're in a situation where they are not being taught the way they learn. So if you can change that, if you can, you know, change around a few things, you would notice that your child is going to pick up tremendously. And one of the things I've emphasized during this webinar series is the fact that the learning environment, the love for learning are also very important, you know, when it comes to enhancing a child's performance. Sometimes children may struggle just because um, their learning environment is not appropriate. They may struggle because, you know, their love for learning has been washed away. I love this quote 
um, that says that it is not knowing, but the love for learning that makes the scientific man. It is not knowing. So the scientific man is not extraordinary. It's not wow, just because he knows. Usually when we think of people like Albert Einstein, Isaac Newton, you know, we think of Thomas Edison. We just think, hey, they were born intelligent. They were born smart. They have like a hundred and they have 1000 IQ. You know, they are so smart, so intelligent. They are geniuses even, right? And you think that they did what they did because of the big brain they had. And, and, and actually that's not true. I shared with you in one of the past sessions about the fact that I myself was intrigued to find out that each and every one of these great people I just mentioned had learning disadvantages, right? They had learning disabilities. For example, I think it's either Isaac Newton or Albert Einstein that had dyscalculia. Dyscalculia is actually a, a learning disability that makes it difficult for you to learn maths. So it's, a, it's, it's how the brain is made. They have that that, that their makeup makes it difficult for them to learn maths, makes maths a struggle for them, right? But that was not a barrier for them. They were able to still make a name in mathematics in the same area where they were known to have disabilities and yet they were able to thrive. So even the disability is not a limitation. It just depends on how you see it. It just depends on what you make of it. It just depends on what you know, because you can always overcome the obstacles that come on your path if you know what to do. You either fly over the obstacles, you can use them as stepping stones as well. I shared the story too of Agatha Christie, who is one of the prolific writers of history. And we have, I think her books have sold over a hundred million copies worldwide. And she was said to have dyslexia, Dyslexia is a disability that makes it difficult for somebody to read. She had dyslexia, and yet she was a prolific writer. She became a prolific writer. What are the odds that someone who has difficulties reading, you know, reading, that would naturally begin to hate reading, maybe hate books, becomes a prolific writer? So it's not the knowing that makes the scientific man. It's not the knowing that makes, you know, these people that have done great things, but it is the love for learning because when you love to learn you are patient you're able to overcome obstacles because you keep trying to find a way through instead of giving up when a child loses their love for learning they lose their and they lose their zeal to try to try they lose that determination to work through challenges right and find solutions and that's how the first thing that's why i said I shared on my blog post yesterday that the first thing that shows up when a child is struggling with their learning is that they lose their motivation. They lose their interest. You discover that your child suddenly doesn't want to do homework anymore. You discover that your child, you know, that used to be very eager to go to school, maybe doesn't want to go to school anymore. It has to be a struggle every morning to get them out the door because learning cannot be enjoyable when a child struggles with it. Think about it. Even as an adult, we are naturally drawn to the areas where we know we can win, right? You obviously quickly pick up the task that you know you can do at the snap of a finger. But when you discover that something is hard for you, you'll find yourself trying to dodge it every now and then. So learning becomes a chore when a child struggles with it. So the child, you find the child losing interest, trying to avoid it because they are struggling. That is why knowing how to help your child is crucial because even just nurturing your child's love for learning can be the secret ingredient that can actually help your child overcome the obstacles that they may face along their academic journey. So when a child long struggles with learning, the first thing to do is not just to quickly rush and get a lesson teacher. The first thing to do is not to make your child sit for more and more hours going at the same books, right? One of the things I share with the parents that I coach on any of my courses is the fact that the brain is like a muscle. If you want the brain to lift heavier weights, you don't go, you know, adding extra hours to keep struggling, trying to lift the weights. No, you go first and build the muscle that has to come back and lift that weight. It's the same thing with the brain. So it's not about having the child sit for more and more hours on that same spot, just trying to, you know, go make or have a breakthrough with their learning. But it's about, you know, figuring out the strategies that can help your child get more even during the little time that they put in with their learning. So learning has to be efficient for your child to have great results. It's not about the number of hours you spend, but it's about how efficient 
the time that you have dedicated to the learning is going to be. And efficiency needs knowledge. You need to know what exactly you need to do to help your child um, more out of their learning. I, 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 this, uh, my inspiration for this back to school webinar is because I, as a parent, I have children on, 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 on both ends of the academic spectrum. I have children who, you know, uh, who are excelling very well on their academic journey, you know, excellent and at the top. And I also have a child who has an atypical learning style that is not very common and who struggled a lot at some point on their parenting journey. But because of what I was able to learn and how well I was able to help that child, you know, get up and move on, that is why I know that parents who may be in the same shoes that I was at that time will really benefit from knowledge like this that can help them know exactly what they need to do to help a struggling child get back on their feet. See, when a child is struggling academically, one of the things that is eroded away is their self-esteem. Because imagine the kind of labeling that that child has to go through, maybe in their class. You know, there are some children that literally tell their parents, you know, I'm not so smart. I had a parent share with me how their child, you know, whenever they get a task that is difficult, they will simply take it and hand it over to their brother and say, my brother is more smart, so he's going to be able to do this. I can't do it. You know, a child loses their self-belief. Their self-concept begins to deteriorate just because they of the struggles that they have been through that has brought them to a point where they now think that they are not able to do hard things. So nurturing the love for learning is key. And if your child would love learning, then it is worth it for you to invest the time and the resources to not just figure out what your child's learning style is, but to help your child understand how they learn and also build study habits around how your child learns best. Great. So we're going to look at um, the different learning styles, understanding your child's learning style. This is one of the very first places that you have to look. When a child begins to struggle in their academics, right, one of the places that you have to look um, at, at first or that you have to check first is whether your child's learning style is being catered to. Is your child, does your child speak or understand the language that is being used to teach them? And how can you help, you know, get that communication to go between your child and their teacher? or between your child and even yourself as a parent. This comes by understanding how your child learns. So identifying your child's learning style can actually help you tailor your child's education to the child's needs and preferences, right? So if you know your child needs this and this to be able to do better at their learning, then that's what you, as a parent, you give to them because you have understood that this is how my child learns. Maybe you can actually, it can help you also collaborate better with your child's teacher to actually help your child on their academic journey. One of the things as a parent you must be skillful at doing is forming a collaborative relationship with your child's teacher, where you're able to meet up with your child's teacher and you know throw some gems and shed some light on who your child is, how your child learns, what your child needs. Because imagine a teacher having a class of 10, 15 pupils, and each of them are different. And as a parent, you come up and you're able to say, hey, this is who my child is, this is what my child, where my child struggles, this is what my child needs to do better. The teacher, when teaching, may know how to, you know, tweak their lessons to be able to cater to the needs that that child may have, that your child may have. So this is a very, very important thing for parents to learn. So when the way a child is being taught does not match how the child learns, the child will struggle. You cannot be taught by a Chinese teacher when you're an English-speaking student. You're going to struggle. That is the root of learning incompatibility, the mismatch between how a child learns and how the child is being taught. So there are four main learning styles. Let's get into it. There are four main learning styles. I'm using the VAC model. The VAC model postulates four learning styles. Those are the four most common and most commonly used learning styles, right? We have the visual learner, we have the auditory learner, we have the reading writing learner, and we have the kinesthetic learner, kinesthetic learner, or they are called tactile learners. Tactile has to do with touch. So we can call them touch learners, but they are called tactile or kinesthetic learners. So visual learners, auditory learners, reading and writing learners and the kinesthetic learners. So the, 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 one of the things that is very fascinating is the fact that the education system 
I don't want to say Africa, but I'll I will just talk about our setting, Cameroon. The education system here in Cameroon caters mostly to the visual, auditory, and the reading, writing learner. Kinesthetic learners, tactile learners are the ones that usually struggle because you go ahead, you're going to see why they struggle. Because the way they learn actually goes against the system, right? Actually goes against the standards of our system. And the way they learn can, can actually be looked at as a problem maybe in the classroom, because what they need to be able to learn effectively is actually one of the things that are fought in the classroom. We'll look at that as we go ahead. So the visual learner, let's start with the visual learner. Now, as I'm going to be going through these different learning styles, you may begin to see your child. You're going to be able to identify certain things that your child may have been, may have been demonstrating, but that you were not able to understand what it meant. So these learning styles is actually a telltale um, 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 sign of the things that a particular person, even you as an adult, as we go through them, you will see how you learn. There are many adults who don't know the kind of learners they are. They don't even understand how they learn. They just naturally gravitate towards certain um, things whenever they are trying to learn something. So visual learners, if I could, if I could summarize the visual learner in one phrase, it would be, when I see, I understand. Visual has to do with sight, right? When I see, I understand. So the visual learner is a learner that learns through observing or seeing things, right? Visual learners do not do well with abstract lessons. They need to be able to see. I'm one of those who understands this very well because I am a visual learner. I am mostly a visual learner because yes, you can be more than one type of learner. I'm, I'm, I'm a big, big, big visual learner. One of the subjects that I could not do well in was history. I remember we were forced to take history in Form 5, when I was in Form 5 in secondary school. And I actually registered for the GC, but I didn't take the course. I, I, I just did it because they, they forced me to do it. And I struggled with it because one of the problems I had with history was the fact that there were no images, right? We just had a textbook. We just had our notes, were just notes, notes, notes. That's one of the things I hate about history. Just notes and notes and more notes and more notes. Visual learners struggle with abstract things. You know, things that don't have a graphic part of it where you can see something, right? They do well when they're able to see pictures and diagrams and, you know, they're able to um, 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 have a mental map of what they are learning. One of the things that I do very often is that I will close my eyes and try to visualize what I'm learning. Visual learners do well when they are able to see what they are learning. And yes, they do take notes, right? Visual learners are known to do what they call taking mental snapshots, where if they have seen it, they will remember it. That's how it works for them. They, their memory is jogged by things that they had seen before. So when they see it again, you know, their memory is, is, is triggered. So visual learners are able to remember faces more than names. So a visual learner can see somebody and say, hmm, I've seen this person somewhere. Though they may not remember the name of the person, but they are very good with faces. They are very good to remember. So you may see your child that has seen maybe a relative that they last saw, you know, a couple of years back. And when they see them again, they're able to say, I have seen this, I have this somebody that I know. They may not remember the name, but they are able to remember that this face is familiar. Visual learners, you know, are able to remember where things are kept easily because once they have, if they have seen it before, if they have seen it somewhere, they are able to, they are good at finding things, right? If they had seen it before. And that's so true for me. At home, they call me Google sometimes because if you want to keep anything, just show it to me. Once I see it and I see where you kept it, if you ask me later, it just comes up because once I see it, I make a mental snapshot and that's it. So visual learners do really well when they are able to see, to observe, to have a mental or a visual of what they are learning. That is why a visual learner, if you just give them a book that is just full of notes, they may not really be able to grasp the concept really well. But if you give them a book that has illustrations in picture, in charts, in diagrams, they are able to grasp the concept that they are learning. What does this mean? One of the ways you can identify if the child you have is a visual learner is by the fact that they are going to love images. They like images, they like pictures, they like images, they like looking, they like colorful books, 
right? My first child is a visual learner. He is a very, very, very big picture or book guy. He loves reading a lot. Visual learners also love reading, right? They struggle with spoken directions. We just tell them, go here, do this, do this, do this, do that. They may struggle with it, right? They may find it hard to remember. And they are also easily distracted by noise. Yes, most learners are easily distracted by noise. So the visual learner will struggle with, um, with, will struggle with spoken directions. But if you write it down and give it to them, they may do better. Particularly, they are, they are good with maps. They are good map readers because what map, a map is an image. So they are good map readers. So if you give them an image that helps, you know, portray what it is that you're trying to teach them or trying to tell them, they are going to be able to grasp it even faster. So they are very good at visualizing, right, the things they hear. So sometimes for me, when I have a project that I'm trying to work on and I'm really, really trying to build it, I close my eyes and try to see, you know, try to see my thoughts coming together. And that's one of the ways that I, it helps me make sense of what I'm trying to do, where I'm trying to do, go, or what I'm trying to achieve. So the visual learner sees to learn. The visual learner loves images. They love colorful books. They love picture books. They also love taking notes, right? Like they make detailed, they scribble. What I do sometimes is I, when I'm reading a book, I make short, short notes at the side. Right, because having my own notes, I'm able to like take a snapshot of what I've just learned. Particularly if it's a book that is just all writing, not much illustration. I usually need to write down some short notes that can help me help quickly jog my memory. So once I do that, I take a mental snapshot of it and then I'm good to go. Visual learners are very visual, they are always looking around. That's why they're easily distracted. So we put them in an environment where maybe the TV is flashing in the background, even if there's no sound because they are visual. They're going to always, you know, find themselves looking up and trying to catch whatever it is that is trying to grab their attention. So if you have a child who's a visual learner, and while they are doing their homework, if you think you've turned down all the volume and the TV is still there, normally kids are easily distracted. But visual learners particularly will find themselves always trying to look around to see, you know, those many colors that keep flashing on the screen. So for a visual learner, they are learning tips, right? A visual learner's study habits. What kind of study habits? How do visual learners develop their study habits? So for a visual learner, since they thrive by seeing what they are learning, they need to see to understand. It means that effective study habits for them has to largely involve seeing what they are learning. This means that they're going to do well if you use flashcards. They're going to do well if you get them, if you teach them how to um, 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 summarize what they are learning in a diagrammatic form. I, I was very fond of, you know, drawing either organigrams or, you know, flow charts. You know, there are some concepts that you learn, particularly in subjects like biology or science. I, was just, I, I, I did science. So in science, most processes that you're taught actually have a cycle. They have like a step-by-step -step form. So the way I used to study was that I would, you know, try to put down, reproduce what I have learned in the form of a diagram. It can be a flow chart, it can be a, 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 a diagram, it can be an, just any kind of illustration because that helped me keep it, right? That helped me, you know, retain it. So visual learners need to watch, right? If they are able to watch what they are learning, they are going to be able to keep it better. Videos. These children can do well if you accompany their learning with visuals. Sometimes it could be a video. They could be learning something and you can find a way to help emphasize the lesson using a video. They are good with videos. They are good with videos and writing down stuff. If they write down, you know, small scribbles, small notes, small summaries at the side of their main notes, it can also help them do better because not everything can really be fully expressed in a diagram. They can draw what they are seeing. They can draw what they are thinking. Getting them to journal is also a great way to help them retain learning to help them, you know, do better with following instructions, right? You can also help them to color code. Now, visual learners, since they are visual, they need things that capture attention. So you can actually buy your child highlighters. Highlighters can help them, you know, create visuals even from their boring notes. 
if a visual learner is able to highlight, maybe they can highlight points, important points in their notebooks. It can actually help them to be able to catch a better mental picture of what they are learning. Because I'm sure the visual learner, if I knew this with history, maybe it could have been better for me. Because I had to drop history because I just couldn't take the many notes that came with difficulties and yet nothing. I read textbooks when I was in secondary school. I don't do well reading notebooks. I do better because textbooks are colorful. Textbooks have images. Textbooks have illustrations. But the notebook, just your teacher, once they're done explaining on the board, they just dictate and dictate and dictate. Economics, you know, just dictating, dictating. History, same thing. Literature, same thing. I couldn't really do well with those things because I'm visual. So the next set of learners is the auditory learners, right? And the auditory learner, if I could summarize again in a sentence, is that the auditory learner learns best when they hear. So the auditory learner hears to learn, right? So the, their ears are their asset. Their hearing is their asset. So the subject matter that they are being taught needs to be reinforced using sound. So they prefer to listen to lectures than to read notes. So you'll find them paying very keen attention in class, trying to hear what the teacher is saying. Now, this already gives you an idea of what study habit the, 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 the auditory learner needs to have. We'll look at that as we go to, to the end. So the, the auditory learner, um, you will find them reading, you know, under their breath. Um, they may say, so that is, so that is how the man, they find it difficult to read quietly because they, they need to resonate what they are learning. So they need to reinforce it with sound and sometimes it may be reading to themselves, reading out loud. They may be slower at reading and they may repeat things that, is, um, 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 that are told to them for them to retain it. Remember I said, they need to reinforce what they are learning using sound. So you may tell your son, please go to the kitchen, take the cup on the table and put it inside the fridge. And after five minutes, take it out and da, 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 da. And, and the child will say, okay, I should go to the kitchen. I should take the cup on the table. I should put it inside the fridge and after five minutes. So remember they are reinforcing. So they do well when they have that reinforcement, when they're able to hear. When they're able to hear it, then they're able to retain it better. So sometimes they will re resonate, they will reinforce whatever it is you're telling them using sound. So they love to listen. Why? Because they are auditory learners. They are good listeners. They listen because that's how they pick up information by listening. So they prefer to listen to instruction, to instructions rather than read them. So they do well with this Google, um, this, this, this Google instructors, this Google, um, this readout, GPS, um, um, reading out stuff where they tell you turn left, turn right. Remember, they are auditory, right? So instead of reading a map, the visual learner may be better at reading a map and understand, okay, follow here, turn left here. But the auditory learner will want somebody to read it out to them and they do better in that manner. So they are also good talkers, right? Because, hey, they love listening. They love words. They are wordy. They are also good talkers. So they are, the auditory learners are there. They are really, um, um, they are wordy people. No, not worthy, not worldly, but wordy, word, wordy. So they are chatterboxes. They tend to talk a lot because they love to, you know, they love words. They love hearing. They love sound. And one of the things that they also love is music. The auditory learner loves music. The auditory learner loves music. That's one of the things you're going to find them really, really um, drawn to. Because anything that you know triggers their ears is one of the things that you're, they're going to gravitate towards. Auditory learners struggle with um, the struggle because they get easily distracted by noise. So for an auditory learner, if your child is an auditory learner, then they're going to struggle with studying in a noisy environment. One of the things you can do for that child is to always ensure that their learning environment is quiet for it to really, really be suitable for them to get the most out of their study time. So if your child is reading in an environment where there's music booming in the background, you know, people are talking, maybe this, the house is so busy, they're going to struggle with distraction. The child is going to keep, you know, turning away. We said the visual learner, it may be just the TV playing quietly in the background or people passing around that can distract them. But for the visual, for the auditory learner, is the sounds they study best in a quiet environment right so for their study habits study habits that you can that can help the auditory learner do better at their learning one of the very first things that we have shared uh, i mentioned when it concerns auditory learners is the fact that they are drawn to music so converting um difficult or complex concepts into songs they can find ways 
to you know sing their lessons or sing what they are learning and also incorporate mnemonics the use of mnemonics mnemonics is where we use acronyms to build maybe a, a, a formula that helps us remember something i shared about the fact that um, in physics we were taught the primary colors right and we had a mnemonic for primary colors it was roid beef right so those letters in the roid beef actually represents the first letter of each of the primary colors. So R, the letter R stands for red, and so on and so forth. So ROIC B. So each of those, that, that was the acronym that we had. Um, that was the mnemonic, sorry, that we had. That was, a, you know, all the acronyms put together that helped us to remember what it is that, you know, all the colors that constitute the primary colors. Um, of light, the primary colors of light. There are so many like that. Some people have mnemonics or acro um, mnemonics for the books of the Bible, the fruits of the spirit. It can be anything. Whatever it is that you're trying to learn or that your child is trying to learn, that may be complex to remember. I remember when my kids were studying the, the provinces, the regions of Cameroon and their capitals. You know, in such a lesson, they, 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 we had to go over it a couple of times for them to, to grasp it. We actually came up with songs, we actually came up with mnemonics, different ways of helping them quickly remember. So study habits, right, for them, for your child to be an efficient learner, you need to figure out what works for them. That's why we're learning the different learning styles. Because how a person studies, right, when they get into the examination room and they're going to be required to reproduce what they have been learning, they will need some of these tips or some of these strategies that can help them actually excel. So learning can be more efficient. Your child can retain more from their learning sessions if they use strategies that are adapted to, their, to how they learn, okay? So learning, um, um, auditory learners, they, if you can convert what they're learning into a song, find a way to, you know, um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Think about the nursery school level. At the nursery school level, they use a lot of songs, and these kids never forget. I'm sure even you listening or watching this, you can think of some song you learned in the primary school or nursery school that you still play in your head whenever you're trying to remember something. I shared about this, this song I always sing, and to date, I still sing that song. Whenever I'm trying to remember the days of the, the months of the year that have 30 days, I actually sing it in my head, right? 30 days of September, April, June, and November. All the rest have 31 days, except February alone. <laughs> so the song became, you know, a speech. But it still helps me today because it was a it was a method of memorizing that information. There's some things that you cannot, not everything can be understood. Some things just have to be retained as they are. Like the days of the week, you can't understand them, you just memorize them. So it this these strategies help you understand which one to use depending on your child's learning style. It can actually help make their learning more efficient. So auditory learners do well when they use mnemonics. I've already explained what mnemonics are. When they use music, songs, right? You can also have them record, right? Since they, they need to resonate or reinforce what they are learning through sound, you can also use recorders, audio recorders. Maybe they can, you know, they can, if they have no one to discuss their lessons with, they may actually discuss and explain the concept they have just learned and then play it back to themselves. That's another way to help them retain. So they are very good with audio books. They're very good with audio notes, right? Read out aloud. And also you could also have them teach you. So when your child may be in class four has learned about osmosis, for example, and your child is an auditory learner, you could say, okay, dear, when you're done reading, you know, osmosis, please come and teach me. Because when they reinforce their learning through, you know, the use of words, hearing their own sounds, hearing their own voice, it helps them to retain it. So when you find, you, how do you identify a child as an auditory learner? We you find your child constantly can't read quietly. Your child is always reading, you know, and mumbling under their breath. They really can't read quietly. They like to hear themselves, okay? So they also watch. They can also watch, right? But they need more audio. They need audio. So they do well when they have audio or they can hear what they have been learning over and over and over, right? So try reading out aloud. Encourage your auditory learner. Don't shut them down when you hear your child say, can't you read quietly? No, that child needs to reinforce their learning through sound. So you can actually encourage your child, if they're an auditory learner, encourage them to read to themselves. So your child may say, so osmosis, osmosis is the first, the first, the first image. So not necessarily, you can teach them how to read to themselves without this expression because that's how they learn, that's how they understand, 
right? And also have them repeat what they are, you know, they should say to themselves over and over. That's another way that it helps them memorize. They can discuss it and talk about that. Origin learners do well when they are part of study groups, study groups where they discuss. So not everybody does what we study discussion groups. That's why schools have different strategies. Schools have group work. Group work is very resourceful for auditory learners because during the group work, not only do they get to teach their peers, but they also hear, you know, there's that back and forth exchange when they discuss what they are learning. It helps consolidate, you know, the subject that they are trying to study. And remember the final thing that for their study habits, the auditory learner needs a quiet learning environment. They need a quiet study environment. So when your child is an auditory learner is going to really help them find a time when they can get the most quiet possible and also help them, you know, um, by themselves to always pick out maybe the area of the house or of the place where they are studying that is most quiet because that's what they need. If not, they're going to be constantly distracted and their learning can't be effective. Now, the next learner, the third learner is the reading, writing learner. The reading, writing learner, you know, these are, these are people that we, I think each and every one of us has a component of reading, writing, learning. But reading, writing learners actually learn through reading and writing, just like the heading, just like the title. Reading, writing learners learn through reading and writing. But here's what's peculiar about them. They enjoy, they actually enjoy taking notes. They are the ones you always find in a meeting, you know, jotting down stuff. They're telling them something simple. Mama's, okay, you're giving your child instruction. The child wants to write it down. They are reading, writing learners. They thrive by writing. They love writing. They are very big on notes. You know, the job, maybe they, they can actually take a class session that was taught. They take their class notes, and then they actually make notes out of the notes. Those are reading, writing learners. I had friends who had two books for every subject. They had the main book, and then they had their own book where they had made their own notes. And sometimes their notes are just amazing. Sometimes I'll take my friend's um, um, own notebook that they have, have actually developed their own notes from the class notes. And you find that it is so well digested. And once you read that, it's really great. So reading, writing learners are big on notes. These are kids who take their time, you know, to write down notes. They're very detailed in their note taking. And sometimes they actually make, to help them learn better, they make notes out of their notes. Okay, and they'll do well with writing essays. They also do well reading textbooks, right? Textbooks too have a lot of words, so they do well reading textbooks. They may prefer to work alone than in groups. Not everyone does well with group work. Reading and writing learners are actually people that prefer to study alone. Remember, they, they make their own notes anyway. So they study to learn. And people that are very big on spending time with their notes, they read for hours. And, and all of that. So you learn, they learn by reading and writing. And the information um, that they are actually putting down is put down in a traditional way because this is usually the most common learning style, reading and writing learners. They are, it's very common because, I mean, almost every academic um, institution has to do with taking notes, with taking notes and, you know, writing and reading out notes and all of that. So they like to read, they love reading. They prefer to read or write down something once they are learning. They are they will not do very well with just you know hearing info, uh, um, hearing um, instruction you know just just spoken out like that. They do well when you, they are very good at reading written out instructions. So this is the child. Um, remember I mentioned that your parenting also will do better or will actually be enhanced be enhanced if you understand how your child learns. If you have a child that's a reading, writing learner, then this is the kind of child you can actually leave instructions pasted on the fridge. You know, after school, please do the following. Take the list out of the fridge. Do da, 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 and you leave like 10 instructions all written down. And the reading, writing learner will do very well executing them. But the auditory and the visual guide is not so much, right? So the, 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 the auditory learner, the reading, writing learner is very big on notes. They are good students because, of course, they take notes very detailedly. They are attentive in class. But here is where they struggle, right? They struggle because they find it difficult learning things through diagrams. They're not very diagrammatic. <laughs> They're not very diagrammatic. And they may be disorganized as well, right? They tend to be a little bit disorganized in their presentations. They tend to be a little bit 
I'm sorry, they tend to struggle with following these organized presentations. Why? Because a presentation is mostly verbal, right? It's true that they may have in our day and time, they have PowerPoint and stuff, but a presentation is not, you know, properly sequenced. They may struggle keeping up with it. So one of their, so their study habits, how to help this particular child build effective study habits is that they are readers, right? They love to read. So you need to be able, this child will take information better if they are able to have notes. This is the child that will be messed up if they don't have notes. A visual learner may be able to sit at the back of the class and just watch what is being taught, watch the decision, how the teacher illustrated it, the examples given, and they'll be okay. Watch the experiment and they'll be fine. But the reading writing learner needs their notes. They need detailed, well updated notes to be able to keep up with what they are learning, right? And they also need to take notes. So sometimes you may encourage your child to make their own notes out of the notes, right? Like what they have read, how they have understood it, they should write it out again. They should write it out again. So you'll find them making out their own notes. You know, they read and then they put it aside. They read what they read, they're reading osmosis, they put it aside and then they make their own notes to see how well they've understood based on what they have learned. So it's not cramming, it's different from cram work, right? So they need to rewrite. Sometimes they even need to recopy the notes. Just by recopying the notes for them is a reading study. So a reading, writing, a reading writing learner, just by recopying the notes that were given in class during their own study time, maybe, you know, actually helps them grasp the concept that they are learning. So they need to use their own words to explain what it is that they learn, okay? And this is, a great way to help your reading writing learner to study effectively, encourage them to make their own notes, encourage them to always ensure that their notes are well updated, encourage them to, um, um, to also recopy, they may recopy as well as a means of you know, retaining what it is that they learned. So the last category of learners is the kinesthetic, the tactile learners. Most children that you would encounter or that I have encountered, that actually had difficulties with their learning tend to, to be kinesthetic learners, to be tactile learners, especially in our setting. Because the way we teach, the way we learn, the way teaching is done in the classrooms here in our setting, it caters mostly to reading, writing, visual, and auditory, right? The visuals don't struggle too much because most of what is being taught, their teacher usually illustrates. And even if the teacher doesn't illustrate, they have textbooks. Like I said, in high school, I didn't even use text, notebooks. I used my textbooks. University, same thing. Medical school, same thing. I'm a textbook person. I never understood it until I finally learned about the different learning styles. Oh, that's why I love textbooks. I'm a visual learner. I'm a very, very big visual person. I need to see. I need to see everything I'm doing. The auditory learners, we talk about the sound, how they need to hear what they are learning re reinforced or how they need to reinforce what they are learning through sound. It may be by discussing what they are learning with someone else, maybe teaching you their parent or teaching their classmate or even presenting in front of the class. It may be by recording themselves, explain what they have just read. If you have a child taking a GC, listen to what I'm saying. Your child is an auditory learner. These are tips that they can actually can actually help them get the most out of what they are learning. And you find your child going from C's to A grades just by practicing these study habits that are adapted to how they learn. So the auditory learner may just, and you encourage them actually to read out. They should not try to read like every other person. You may find yourself saying, read quietly, you know. And the thing is when you don't have knowledge, you find yourself fighting what is actually good because you don't know that this thing is actually what I should encourage. So what the child needs to learn is not how to, um, it's not how to read quietly, but excuse me, it's not how to read quietly, but it's how to read appropriately for them, but without distracting the next person. They need to learn how to read the way they understand best, but without distracting the next person. So if you have a child that can't read silently, please don't shut them down. That may be, that's most like an auditory learner. Encourage them to read, but to not distract the next person. So they can read quietly to themselves, or they should always find a quiet environment that um, where they can study without disturbing any other person. So kinesthetic learners, the tactile learners. The kinesthetic learner is the, amongst all the other learners, is the one that will most likely struggle, except they have a parent like you now who's taking this course, that knows about the different learning styles and that knows that what this child does is not 
something that is not intentional, but that is just how they learn, right? So tactile means touch. So the kinesthetic learner or the tactile learner is a person that moves to learn. That's why I said earlier that this particular learner is the kind of learner whose style of learning goes against the standards in the system. Imagine a child in class who is always fidgeting, who can't sit still. What happens? Hey, why are you always dancing? Why can't you sit still? It becomes a problem. Meanwhile, the child needs to move to learn. This particular types of learners, they need to interact with what they are learning for it to be assimilated. So they do not, they do not even, they cannot even manage with abstract learning. They need to be able to interact with their learning, with the concept that they are learning. They need hands-on activities to help them consolidate what they are learning. Because if not, it's going to be difficult for them to grasp the concept. Now, these children, you will find that they actually are able to grasp the lessons that they are uh, um, um, that are being um, taught to them using um, um, experiential situations. For example, they're teaching them about I love using osmosis, osmosis, and you actually bring out a potato, you put salt in it, you put the potato in water, and you actually see osmosis happen they will understand that lesson. But if it just happens in class, the teacher just says, sit down, don't move. And it's just talking away. And the person also distracted because they can't even sit still. And they've been sitting still for very long periods. So what are their characteristics? The very first one is that they need to move to learn, right? They learn by touching and doing, okay? And they, 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 they need physical movement. And they are usually very good at sports. They are usually energetic people, right? They are very good at extracurriculars, more than what happens in the classroom because extracurricular has to do with a lot of movement. So they are usually very sports oriented. Most good people who are very athletic, they also could be kinesthetic learners. They are usually kinesthetic. Kinesthetic learners are usually very good at sports because it has to do with movement, right? They are also very good with their hands. So amongst my kids, my kinesthetic learner, when it comes to art, when it comes to play do whatever, anything that has to do with fingers, they are very, very good, right? They are, how they do their artwork, how they do their extracurricular stuff, they do puzzles. They are very, very good at those things because they are very tactile, they are touchy people. And I also found that even the, uh, my child's love language actually had to do with touch, right? His love language is touch. So he's very tactile in that way. So they move to learn. They like hands-on stuff. When they are learning, is when they are learning something that they can interact with, they are at their best because that's how they grasp concepts. They don't do well with just learning, you know, they're just talking. So when you just keep explaining to that child, the child gets lost at some point. Because kinesthetic learners need to see, need you to do, they need to do, they need to interact, they need to have some movement. So they will also struggle with sitting still for long periods of time you'll find them getting antsy and they, they've lost their focus at a, at a moment. So kinesthetic learners, they need to move. They need to move. They have a short attention span. Now, this is where many parents may actually get lost because you may, a child that has focus issues is not necessarily a kinesthetic or tactile learner. They may just be you know, children that are, that are suffering from the negative effects of excessive screen use, it's one of the effects that is going to have that your child's attention span will be what will be shortened, further shortened. So children naturally, as they grow older, um, their, their attention span gets better, okay? But kinesthetics have issues with their attention span. So the challenge now will be distinguishing between a child that has focus issues, maybe because they have ADHD, maybe because they are autistic, maybe because they have had too much screen time or screen addiction problems, and a child that is kinesthetic, a child that has this because of how they learn, okay? And they easily get fidgety. This is that child that you say, sit still now. How can you learn by, you're always moving. And this is, these are the children that suffer a lot because you have parents hitting, because the child can't sit still. This child cannot focus. This child is always moving. Stop shaking your legs. Stop moving your hands. Can you just sit still? So the very thing the child is trying to do to help them learn what you're trying to teach them is the thing you're fighting because you don't know that that's what they need to learn.
right? So what we need to do is to learn how they learn and to teach them strategies that can help them adapt to how our learning system is. This is the kind of child that you absolutely need to meet their teacher and explain how your child learns because your their teacher is going to find themselves constantly going against your child, maybe because your child is constantly, you know, fidgety or it may actually help the teacher to introduce what we call power breaks into the course of the day because this child cannot sit still for long. At some point, they start getting distracted, they start, you know, needing to, they start fidgeting, they're lost because they need to move. They're outdoor people, they need to move. Now let's talk about the study strategies for this particular child. So if you have a child that is kinesthetic, that has been struggling with their learning, okay, has difficulty sitting for long periods, that now you know that needs to move to learn, that needs to interact with their lessons to be able to get the most out of them. Here is what you need to do to help your child study or learn effectively, okay? The very first thing that you need to do is that you need to find a way for your child to interact with what they are learning. I remember when my son, my kinesthetic learner, um, was doing addition and subtraction, sub subtraction. I had to get um, physical numbers so that I could, re I could reproduce the problems in front of him and then we use physical counters to get to get him to understand the concept when he was doing ratios and fractions we actually go into the kitchen and we cut up an orange cut up a banana we also understand quarters we cut an orange into four we show him that two quarters make a half and he sees the two halves we cut into four he sees the four halves we cut into three he sees one third so that concept was able to sink because I knew how to teach it. But normally, they come home with the homework and you're using just the paper. Read this again. Why can't you do this? Your friends have gotten it. Why aren't you getting it? That child needs to interact with what they are learning. They need hands-on activities to help them grasp what they are learning. So finding ways for your child, to, finding ways to bring the lesson to life will help your kinesthetic learner. Okay? Another thing that you want to do is that you need to be spontaneous and try to make the learning fun. So don't be, don't be uh, monotonous in when you're teaching a kinesthetic learner. You need to be spontaneous, find ways to make it engaging and lively, right? And try to get the work off paper. Remember I said they need to interact with what they're learning. Finding ways to get the work off paper, you know, in different ways. For example, if you try to act out a lesson, maybe they are learning about, um, I, was, I was teaching my children how to make friends. We had to do a lot of role playing. We had to act it out create different scenarios. My kinesthetic learner picked up this lesson, he ate it up and he was actually the best in it. He came home at one time um, and, they were, and they had been taught um, um, nouns. And when they were tested after that lesson, he had two and 10, he didn't get it. He couldn't understand it. I know that really sometimes some lessons are actually challenging to bring to life. But like I said, with them, you just have to be spontaneous. Find different ways to get them to, you know, um, um, interact with the lesson. So in this case, I actually used the video. I went on YouTube, I got a video of a kid that explained to them what nouns were, the different kinds of nouns, proper nouns, common nouns. And the next day he went to class and he had all, he passed all because he was able to, and then we did it physically. We looked at things in the house. We touched different things. And so this is what it is. I touched the table. He said, that's a common noun. What's that? We touched it. And I, I will be, he said, a proper noun because my name is Jennifer. So he was able to, to that was him interacting with the lesson. So when your child comes home as a kinesthetic, what you do at home is where the actual learning may be for them. Because in class, the teacher may not be able to do all of that. So when you don't know what to do, you'll find your child struggling academically because their teacher may not have the capacity to you know, bring the lesson out, bring every lesson out to them like that. You may actually meet some teachers who may be understanding enough to want to go the extra mile to help your kinesthetic learner learn. Now, the second strategy that they need for their learning is power breaks. Remember, I have shared that the kinesthetic learner cannot sit still for long. So what do they need? They need to move. So you could actually have a principle where you learn for 10 minutes and they get to play for two minutes. They learn for 20 minutes, they get to play for five minutes. And you let a child know before time, remember I have said that expectations help children thrive. So kinesthetic learners may not even want to go into the homework session because they know that you're going to force them to sit for hours. Now that you know, what you need to do differently is that you let your child know that, hey, you bring it, maybe you have to, you agree on the game you're going to play. So we're going to um, do this, we're, we're going to do, maybe the child has 10 maths problems to go through. 
Okay, we'll do number one, two, and three, and then we are going to go and blow bubbles. We're going to do number um, um, number four, five, and six, and then we can go and you know place a toilet shower. Or you can do this, and we're going to throw the ball. So those power breaks they actually help to refocus the kinesthetic child to the task at hand. Normally with children, you need to avoid having them sit still because children normally need movement, right? But the kinesthetic learner even more. But when homework time is so cumbersome, right? My heart breaks when I hear of schools that have the habit of taking away break time from children because a child cannot sit still from morning 7.30 a.m. till 2 p.m. They're still sitting still. What are they learning for all that time? You know, a little break every now and then is essential. Let the kids get up, move around. The kinesthetic learner does better. They are the ones that really, really thrive when you make enough room for them to play. Normally, play supports learning for children, but for the kinesthetic learner, they actually need it. They cannot even do without it. So making room for your child to play go through a variety of play. If you're taking my, my, I have a, a focus and rehabilitation course where I help children that have focus issues from screen overuse or children who are even autistic or have ADHD, where this, this course is all about helping them build their focus, right? One of the things that they do is that they engage in different kinds of play that are targeting their focus to help build their focus. But the kinesthetic learner, you can actually help build this child's focus. Because it's not in every environment where the teacher may tell them every 30 minutes, stand up, sit down. Not everybody. As they grow higher on the academic ladder, they need to learn to adapt, right? And there are certain things you can teach that child that can help them thrive, even if they're not able to stand up, hands up, hands down, go outside and play and all that. But in university, we actually get to sit sometimes for six straight hours, just sitting and just learning and learning and learning. If you're kinesthetic, you'll struggle. So you teach your child different things. You can teach your child that they can change position subtly, right? They can constantly change, or they could be hand gestures you teach your child to do that can help them because they need to move. While the lesson is going on, they are doing that. They can be tapping their feet, right, quietly, or you know, just moving. They need movement, so they are always on the move. So you can teach your child some subtle gestures that they can actually do. There is a squeeze ball. It's called a mood manager. There's a squeeze ball that um, um, I, I think I found in one of the supermarkets. When I, I think I'll bring it on some session and I'll show you that you can actually get for them. They usually just squeeze on that ball, right? Sometimes you can even put rice in a sock and it can actually work because it has to be something that is compressible but that cannot be squished. So they just squeeze on that, you know, over and over. And that actually helps them focus because when they, they need to have some movement going on, so they squeeze on that. Another thing you can do for your kinesthetic learner is to, you know, be ingenious, be creative. You can have them change their study location every now and then. Today they can study in the living room. Tomorrow they can study in their room. The next day dining section. You know, that change of environment helps for them. We've talked about power breaks. We've talked about, you know, making play a priority for them. We've talked about, um, you know, having finding ways to bring the lessons alive for them. Role play, using videos, you know, maybe um, uh, interact, find, finding ways to make the lesson interactive for them. It's helpful for them. And then we've also talked about the use of finding ways to teach them small movements that they can do even in the classroom without distracting others. So this is how your kind of particular learner try. So that child that is always antsy, always moving, can't sit to sit, sit still, may actually be a kinesthetic learner. So those are all the four learners. And I've also shared with you four different study strategies adapted to the different learning styles. If you have any question, feel free to drop it below. And we're going to look at it even before we round up completely. If you have any question, if you've had any value, if you've gleaned any value from this session, I would love to know in the comments section. So a quick summary of the different learning styles. The visual learner, what the visual learner sees to understand, right? They like to read, you know, they are good spellers usually. They remember better by seeing charts, diagrams, pictures of what they are learning. The auditory learner easily loses focus when they are distracted by a noisy environment, in a noisy environment. They prefer written directions over, sorry, they prefer spoken directions over written directions because they are auditory. So they prefer spoken directions over, reading, over written directions and they enjoy music. They are musical. They also tend to be chatterboxes. They talk a lot, they're talkative. They will not read quietly as well. 
they tend to read to themselves. So they will do better when the lesson is reinforced to them using sound, you know. They do better when they discuss the subject that they are learning. They do better when they are able to um, share what they have been learning so they can hear themselves speak or even just record it and then play it all over again. The kinesthetic learner moves a lot when studying and their movement is not a hindrance to their learning. Their movement actually helps them learn better, okay? They do better with interactive learning sessions right because they need to interact with what they are learning finding ways to use to bring the lesson alive will actually help them grasp it better they like doing to learn so they are doers when they do they remember if you are teaching a child at home who's a kinesthetic learner find ways show them an example do it with them to get them to understand it better just describing it may not work for them right if you do it with them they'll be able to remember if you show them how to do it they may be able to do it rather than just telling them or having them follow a list of written instructions. They'll struggle with that. The reading writing learner, they like to read narratives and, and descriptions. They are readers, they are bookies, right? They are taught to wonder during lectures, but they are very good at taking notes and they are observant, right? Because their notes are usually very detailed because they are, they are, they are worthy people. They are writers, they love writing stuff. They're always scribbling down stuff. So they do well with following written down instructions as well so we've talked about a little bit about how to identify your child's learning style now what can how what are the things you can pick up quickly pick up on to be able to know that hey this child is like that if you've just listened to all the four categories we've shared of the different learning styles by now you should be able to know the kind of learner your child is but in case it just in case you have not been able to pick that up then i'm going to share um, I'm going to go through briefly how you can know how your child learns, right? So try to observe your child in action. Watch how your child expresses themselves, right? Because, for example, auditory learners are wordy people. Talking, they are very good words. They are very good with words, right? Visual learners are very expressive, right? They speak and their faces, you know, they are, they are very expressive. And... They review their emotions a lot through facial expression. They love pictures. They love images. You know, they are drawn to colors. Those are visual people, okay? And there are people that are easily distracted by images. You know, if there's some imaging around, they're going to easily be drawn to that. Um, so another thing you can want to do is to consider your child. I mean, the kinesthetic learner is a movement person. They are always everywhere. They are very good at extracurricular activities. They are active, very good athletic people. They may be kinesthetic and also they have difficulty sitting still for long hours. That's how you will know. Please watch out with distinguishing between a child that has focus issues and a child who is kinesthetic. One of the key differences is that the kinesthetic learner, the child that has focus issues, may not have difficulty learning through notes, through visual, through auditory. But a kinesthetic learner is a child that learns best when they interact with the lesson. So if a child has focus issues, but is able to learn through another way very well, or still doing well, you know, standard in class, maybe just from reading their notes or from, you know, they struggle to, um, to, to listen to lectures, they're able to learn, they are most likely not kinesthetic. The kinesthetic learner is the one that has focus issues, but also struggles to learn through the standard teaching methods. So we want to consider your child's interest as well. A child's primary learning style is usually also reflected in their interest. The kinesthetic learner will be more drawn to extracurricular stuff. They are going, their best moment will be when it's time to paint, when it's time to do something, make something with their hands, when it's time to play football or play outdoors. My kinesthetic learner has to go outside every day, right? During the holidays, outdoor play, he has to do outdoor play. If you take that away from him, that's one of the things where you're really going to find him struggling. Outdoor play, that's where they thrive. They love being out there to interact with nature and all of that. So you're, it's going to be reflected in their interests, right? Auditory learners will show interest in music a lot and sounds. Visual learners will have interest in reading, watching TV, and looking at images and pictures, colorful books, right? You can also ask your child, right? For example, you may ask your child how they prefer to learn. You may ask your child, um, um, what do you do when you're reading? Your child may say, well, when I'm reading, I have difficulties. And like, oh, I'm always talking. I, I try to be quiet, but I can't be quiet. That's your child telling me that I'm an auditory learner. The child has to always mumble when they are reading because that's how they learn. That's a cue that may help you, um, um, you know, pick up that your child is probably an auditory learner. 
So I hope that you've, um, I haven't gotten any questions so far and that's okay. You can still drop at any moment, you come on and I will answer. But I hope that you have gleaned some value from this session. It's actually a repeat session and it's, we've been going on now for just a little bit over an hour. Thank you so much for joining me. And I hope that with all that you have learned, your child, you're going to be equipped, you're going to be well pos better positioned to help your child have a more excellent academic year. Thank you so much for joining me and see you again during my next live session. Bye-bye.